Hello, good morning or afternoon or whatever it may happen to be in your neck of the woods. So recently, there was a bit of a request to do some reviews over some of these uh, you know, games we like to show off challenge runs of. And you know what? The first thing that came to mind was Belsie. So, first of all, I just want to say, this is hands down. Like, if you were ever on the fence over, you know, you're, you're looking at the reviews, looking at some of this other stuff, thinking if you were on the fence, Man, I don't know, if, you know, if I'm gonna go uh, go get it. Just just do it. It's so so good. Let me just get that out of the way right away. Because okay, a, a little bit of background. So I've been essentially I grew up around FFT, Tactics Ogre, all that kind of thing. It's been my jam since forever. I mean, hell, I was a little ten year old doing like Tactics Ogre challenge runs. Was doing uh, single class challenges of FFT and all that kind of thing. Challenge runs of these things just like they click something in the brain that not a lot of things do. So. Basically, I've been going and running any any kind of thing in the genre that I, that I can get a hold of. Like again, with FFT, you got all your single class challenges, you got all these uh, weird kind of mix-ups you can do. You're mostly setting up limitations. Uh, same thing for you know the the kind of uh, simpler tactics ogre. So Knight of Lotus is the one that I started with. I uh, went on to the SNES one later on. You know, I uh, went to uh, went and did like fairy only challenges of ogre battle and all that kind of thing. And why am I mentioning all of this? Because uh, it, well, quite frankly. This, like, if you're into challenge runs, if you're into that weird situation where you like being put into a position where you got to come up with different kind of counterplays for everything, try to come up with weird strategies on the fly, you can't really have your optimal answer to anything, this will blow your friggin' mind. Like, it, <laughs> the entire game is just like that through and through. So, going back to the to the FFT example there, it, it's the most clear inspiration right there. Um, to kind of put where all the different pieces come from. Essentially, you're getting your class system, like your unlocks uh, for your classes, essentially from FFT. You're getting your skill unlocks as a mix of FFT and the new XCOM games. Uh, the visual style is very reminiscent of FFT uh, Advanced and uh, Advanced 2. Uh, essentially, you're getting uh, you're getting this kind of um, a little bit more of a vertical style, a little bit more cartoony style, but with a relatively dark story going on. Um, I will say the aesthetics are one of those sticking points that I've seen a lot of folks uh, bring up. It definitely grows on you, and there's a lot of love put into the animations there. Um, I've actually heard uh, mention of the speed of them being a little bit uh, against some people's brain, but another thing to mention is that you can actually adjust all that in the settings. Like, you can adjust the animation speed, you can adjust uh, anything you want about the game, quite frankly. Um, actually, that's another one of those things that if you're into uh, it's interesting challenges and replay value and that kind of thing, there are challenge options, there are difficulty options, there's little tweaks out the wazoo for this one. I mean, you've got entire men <laughs> you've got two separate menus uh, essentially for different kinds of modes that you can go through. Anything from turning on different versions of injuries and permadeath, which there's an injury and permadeath system if you want it. Uh, the standard is basically somebody takes 10% uh, off their stats as soon as they're uh, as soon as they're knocked out in the fight. You can bring them back, but they're going to be injured and have to take a fight off before the next one. It's a relatively simple way to say, you know what, you're going to mix up your party, maybe mess around with a few different builds. This game is all about the builds, by the way. Um, and uh, you actually do have uh, you do have a lot of ways to uh, to just just really get new characters into it. I mean, I've seen a lot of different approaches in the genre in terms of uh, in terms of getting people up to scratch. I mean, you've got the old uh, like the one that I started with uh, for this one would have been uh, would have been Knight of Lotus. Um, so in that one, you just basically, you scaled your level up to the leader. Okay, that part's there. Then you have the uh, Tactics Over PSP remake, and they're like, okay, you know what? Everybody comes in at the same level. You don't have that. However, whatever class you give them and whatever kinds of uh, setup you set them up with, they will have the points to go unlock several classes right off the bat. You can throw them right into the advanced classes without any worries. There's a few hidden classes that are hidden behind the, funnily enough, uh, behind the class mark system. So yeah, they actually figured out how to take the TOPSB system and just make it work in terms of you have your, you know, your kind of unique classes over here with the class marks. You only get one of uh, one of those at any given time. You can craft more. There's a crafting system. They made it not suck. What a wonder. <laughs> uh, so yeah, a bunch of cool stuff that you can make out of there. You get, you get your same movement items that you'd expect from a lot of the series. Um, you basically get those right off the bat, so that's fantastic. Like especially the fact that you get all your jumping items and stuff like that. In FFT, you had to go until about the midpoint of Chapter Two to get access to those. Uh, in Tactics Ogre, you had to wait until Chapter Four, way into the end game, before you got your movement items. Um, or at least in the PSP remake, I've done a whole lot more of that one. But um, but either way, it's it's kind of got that FFTA two feel feel to it. 
Like, um, basically for anyone that hasn't played FFTA and FFTA2. Um, in FFTA, you can essentially cheese a bunch of systems to get items way earlier than you were supposed to, like depending on what town you put the order, uh, what order you put towns in and stuff like that. And in FFTA, just kind of based on what components you got, you had this bizarre system that would, it, it's not a bizarre system, it was called the Bazaar, like shop, anyway. Um, so basically you would go trade in those components to make a particular thing available. And that's functionally what's going on there, it's kind of like a mix of both. Because you have, uh, you have certain maps that you can get particular items from. Uh, you actually can gather certain things out in the wild, which is a pretty cool system. Hell, there's even map interaction, which uh, it's just not very often that you get to see map interaction properly, uh, not properly put in there. Hell, there's even a perk that allows you to go climb vines and stuff for free. It's, it's cool. Anyway, um, so you have you have all those kinds of systems where you're going. You have all these different resources that you can go gather from different places if you want to. Uh, some of them are a bit harder to get to, some of them you have to go fight particular monsters for and all that kind of thing. But if you want that kind of stuff, if you want to route it out, it's there. Essentially your crafting menu is just in your in your uh, troops menu, essentially. And uh, and yeah, you can just make a bunch of like kind of niche stuff right off the bat, and it feels really, really good. Like, just the kinds of builds that you can go with at all points of the game feel fantastic. And on that note... In terms of items, there's actually another kind of sticking point that's been around... It's been kind of a thing in the genre since forever, which is always the logistics. Because how often were you going through the, through a game, it's like, okay, there's like a 5 fight gauntlet over here, or, you know, in the TOPSP's case, like a 115 fight gauntlet, and suddenly you realize you don't have any more depetrification items, and you're a little bit screwed. Well, basically what they have here is you can craft upgrades to your item inventory, but your item inventory resets between fights. On top of that, the enemy team also has an item inventory, and you can actually use thieves to steal stuff back and forth between them. You even have a counter skill that allows you to just nab one of their items when they're attacking you. It's so cool! It's just so cool, I love it! Uh, like, that particular one just made me so dang happy. Because yeah, you can route out, like, just nabbing some of their inventory. You're, you know, you want to have the, uh, the option for them to revive, but you want to make sure that they don't use it. Like, you just send a thief in, it's like, oh... Let me just go friggin' uh, take your uh, take your revive items. Uh, don't really have time for this. And that's another thing in terms of the revive mechanics. Like it again works kind of like FFTA2, uh, where you basically can just revive anybody on any tile. So you can send somebody out, you know, on a basically suicide rush, and then you just raise them uh, right back up right next to you, which sounds very cheesable, and it is in the best way. Every part on top of that, it should probably be mentioned that uh, if you remember TOPSP's pretty worthless condemn skill. Not only is there something like that to prevent the constant back and forth reviving, but also you can revive each other's party members in different ways. Like, there's a bunch of different uh, ways that this mechanic is utilized. It's just, I don't even want to get into it because it'll probably spoil some of it, but it's just so good! Part of this game has just like this massive, beautiful circle of cheese. Just, uh, it's, it's just beautiful. It's hard to describe all of it because everything interacts in some way. Like, every, every skill. After a little while, you just start looking through the skill trees, and it's like, okay, this can be combined with this, and this, and this, and this. It's like, okay, I have this, you know, re-raise ability over here, and I can go combine that with this other ability that sacrifices the unit to remove debuffs from the entire map. Or essentially just use the re-raise to, uh, to repeatedly put them into a state where they're uh, both putting on a Mirage, which is... Uh, Mirage is basically like the evade state from Tactics Ogre. Um, where they basically can just take one hit, except it's a, it's kind of like a evade and uh, how was what was the magic one? It, it basically both your your physical and magical bubble, except they're both in one skill. So very handy. Just basically lets them evade almost anything as long as that something doesn't evade uh, defensive skills. That's uh, again another just trait to everything. And so, like for example, there was a cheesy build that I had come up with for this guy that kept repeatedly putting himself into a re-raise state while also being able to survive that last hit. So it was Auto Mirage plus uh, uh, plus the Chivalry Tree uh, on a Reaver, which essentially meant that every time that he got down, he would come back with the absolute minimum of his health, have the ability to revive again, also get a free hit that also triggered his uh, his auto revive again, or, or rather, that also triggered his shield again. It's just, you just kept doing this over and over and over. It feels so good. It's so good. Actually, I forgot to mention the Reaver. The reason that that was important on a Reaver is because they had a skill that essentially allowed you to hit for as much uh, as much uh, health as they were missing. You gotta have that in there. Like, every type of attack and skill and whatever else that you can think of that you like from the genre, it's here somewhere. Like, a lot of it's redone. There's a beautiful amount of references to everything else. 
personally, I love the fact that uh, with uh, with the Lord and Princess class, they definitely look like uh, like other uh, tropes in the series. I still don't know whether or not it was meant to be a To reference uh, with uh, with Mr. Alphonse there at the uh, pier. God, that guy was a douche. <laughs> anyway, uh, any dang ways. Uh, yeah, absolutely fantastic in terms of interaction. Everything interacts. Um, again, you can adjust everything. If you get tired of the AI using items, you can just make sure that they never use items. You just have the option to tell them no. Personally, I love the fact that you can turn it up to like, no, they just get all the best items right off the bat and as many of them as they want. And then on top of that, you can just raise up all their stats. You can make sure they equip all this different stuff. Like you, you have um, equipment scaling in terms of how much you want them to actually come in with. Um, you have secondaries that they can come in with. And that brings me over to the generation for this game. So essentially the way that, that the unit generation works, you will never fight the same fight twice. Uh, there, essentially there's like base classes for everybody that are roughly going to stay the same. However, their secondaries, their gear, their reactions, their passives, all of that base is going to essentially get redone based off the difficulties that you chose for yourself. Which means that you can come up with some seriously nasty stuff that's in your way. Like my first time through, I was really surprised by a fight where essentially I could do almost no damage. Because they had one guy in the back that was providing pretty much a giant pile of defensive buffs to one guy in the front that had what is functionally an MP shield ability. Um, who essentially was also uh, completely maxed out for defense because they came in as one of the most defensive classes, and they would just sit there putting on an ability that allowed them to attack anybody nearby as long as somebody else used a single target ability. And they just had a, uh, a gunner in the back repeatedly just sniping people, and every time that they would snipe, this guy would just stab with his spear. And it's just, like, the fact that this was still a first-time run, I was still able to go through and, like, find a way around all of this with a relatively new team. Like, it took a little while, but eventually it was just like this giant puzzle box, and if you turn the difficulty up all the way on this one, not even all the way, this one was actually pretty standard settings, I believe, you can turn it up way up there. In fact, there's a DLC coming out, and I've been looking forward to just doing New Game Plus with all the difficulties up there, because god dang, these, uh, these options are fantastic! It's just so, so good! Um, anyway, so, my point being is that, yeah, every time it's gonna be different, you can never have the optimal answer to everything, and so you just keep building up all these different classes. If you liked that uh, trickle experience mechanic from uh, FFT, uh, so if you didn't know that that was going on, because I actually didn't know until I was doing some runs of it a few years ago. Um, essentially, every time you have somebody training as one class, everybody else uh, will get a little bit of their uh, their leftover uh, leftover points. Uh, for that particular class for themselves. Essentially, they're sharing the knowledge they gain every time they gain a level. Uh, so this basically means that you don't necessarily have to train somebody as one particular thing, or you could put everybody into one class and essentially have that trickle over to the entire team. I mean, if you're worried about, uh, about coming up with a lot of different builds, maybe getting a little bit stuck in terms of uh, how much you want to raise units. Um, I was personally going through it on permadeath uh, the first time through. I, I always love having permadeath mechanics. And... Uh, and yeah, I was able, I think I had a team of like I think 48 units by the end of it, and uh, and yeah, no, most of them were still crazy effective, and it's just it's fun the kinds of weird builds you can come up with. I mean, there's just just tons and tons and tons and tons. Like every time you find a skill, it's like, well, this I'm not sure this is terribly useful, and then immediately like later on you'll you'll run into something else that'll just make it amazing. Like the first time I used dual wield on there. I wasn't sure what the point was, because it's like, okay, so it reduces your attack, but you can also dual wield, so at that point you're better off just using a gun and a shield than using two guns, which, by the way, interesting note, you can actually do that in this one too. That's the only um, uh, only strategy game I know of that allows you to uh, dual wield guns. That's actually a build that the AI used several times, and oh my goodness. Speaking of nasty combinations, actually, like War Mage plus, uh, plus Gunner plus uh, Ninja Passives created a situation where there was a guy with dual wield attack up, uh, as well as the uh, the War Mage skills, which essentially meant that every time that they fired, or no, it was War Mage plus Knight, um, and essentially what would happen is uh, they they would go, they would have uh, they would have one for all, which which is that skill that allows you to attack anything as long as somebody else is attacking. So they would be able to cast as well as fire twice uh, during their attack turn, and then they would be able to go and just like reaction fire, essentially reaction fire the entire map. Um, as soon as long as somebody else was uh, was attacking somebody else, and it was actually one of the boss fights that spawned in with that, and it was brutal. It was wonderfully brutal. 
Um, so yeah, I absolutely adore it. Like, it there's just so much, uh, so much stuff you can play with. Um, I, I really cannot sing its praises enough. Um, in terms of the, the visuals, like I said, that's a sticking point for some. It definitely grows on you. And there's actually a surprising amount of love in there. Um, which, I don't know why I say that's surprising, because tr truth be told, like, this entire game just reeks of all the love they put in here. Um, but yeah, no, in, in terms of the visuals, like, you can customize everything. Like, you, it, this is way more than I, than I ever would have expected customization-wise. Um, basically, any character you can think of, you can probably make. I'm sure that'll end up going up even more once the DLC hits. I mean, I had, like, most of the Knight of Lotus team on there. I had most of the Tactics Ogre characters in there. I had a bunch of FFT characters in there. I had a bunch from just random uh, random other games and all that. It was actually pretty funny to have a pretty successful squad running for a while with uh, Bradford from XCOM in there. Like, you can just do whatever. You can just keep messing around with this ad nauseum. And hell, if at some point you get get tired of a character, you just bring them back over to the guild. It's like, okay, I just want to make this into somebody else now, please. <laughs> and there you go. You keep all their skills and everything else. You can change whatever you want about them. Uh, so there's a lot of that. Uh, again, a, a lot of a lot of customization that you can do there. A lot of counterplay. Um, but yeah, in terms of the visuals there, what I was saying is there's... Like, when it comes to the details and the animations, you can tell they had some extreme fun with it. Like, my personal favorite, uh, there's one of the higher tier caster abilities, a Thunder Locust. It's basically just like Zapdos coming down and body slamming somebody. It's fantastic. It just all, all of the animations have something cool to them. The only ones that uh, the legitimately kind of stuck out to me is, uh, I don't know if this works for some of, the, uh, uh, some of the sorcerer abilities, but there's really only so much that could be done with those. So, honestly, it ended up working. Like, the ice one works fine. Um, most of them work fine. It was mostly, like, the, the dark one. And, uh, I was like, eh, I, don't, I don't know about this one. But, either way, it grows on you. It's fantastic. Just <sighs> don't let it be a stick point. Don't let it miss. Don't let this be the thing that makes you miss this amazing game. Because I've seen that come up. I mean, I was personally in that camp for a couple of years now since this came out. Because I kept looking at it and I was like, oh, I don't know. I've seen a lot of clones and things like that. This is... <laughs> I don't know. Man. As soon as I heard about all those customization options, like, I was just right there. Went for it. And, yeah. Wholeheartedly recommend this. 100 friggin' million percent. This is hands down my favorite, uh, favorite SRPG thing. Probably since Tactics Ogre PSP came out. Like, probably since One Vision. Um, for, for those that never tried the One Vision mod, it's like an overhaul of Tactics Ogre PSP. Um, really, really good. But, just point being... If, you're, if you like that counterplay, if you like that customization, if you like to just like think about weird builds that you can put together, and you like to still be challenged on the other end, you like to see that the AI can pull off some interesting stuff as well, that they can still you know, end up getting, uh, getting the upper hand every now and then, this is your game. And like I said, there's a DLC coming out. Uh, essentially, it's going to be adding, uh, adding more side mission stuff since right now. Oh, actually, that's another little detail. In terms of the uh, little side missions and other type of stuff, your party members, it, like, if, if you played, uh, if you ever, ever played Tactics Ogre, there was, um, there's a cool thing where if you had certain characters, they would show up in certain scenes. In this one, all of your team will just be showing up, like, you'll have, you know, your camp being busy in the background, and all your characters are going around, like, maybe they're having some dinner, maybe they're just hanging out. Like, maybe they're just walking by a scene, maybe some of your, you know, some of your knights there are guarding the camp or something like that. Like, they're, they're doing stuff! It's so cool! I just, I love that little detail. Um, and every cutscene, they're there. Like, it, which, again, kind of works funky with the, uh, with the permadeath system, because it was kind of a last-minute addition, I think. Because I had characters that technically were disabled and, uh, were just sitting there guarding the camp, but again, they specifically say not to use the permadeath system. I personally love it, but it's not gonna be for everyone. Um, basically, the way it works is every time somebody gets injured, they lose another permanent uh, 5% to their stats up until they get up to 5, at which point they're just completely disabled. They don't really disappear, they're just uh, permanently disabled at that point. But uh, it's a fun way to force yourself to use a lot of different party members. Uh, but yeah, uh, so like I said, it's fantastic. Go get it. DLC's coming out, adds a bunch of side missions, uh, adds recruitable monster characters. I mean, in the base game, you technically had one guy that could be all the monsters to some degree, which that guy's really cool. Um, but yeah, so I'm uh, not really going to spoil that one. Uh, in terms of the story, by the way, since uh, I'm sure that'll end up coming up, it's weird because at first I thought it was kind of weak, but then by the end of it, I was was really liking the setting and all that kind of thing. I don't know how much of that was intentional or kind of situational, but um, 
uh, but yeah, it, it actually wound up uh, going to a pretty interesting place there. So, uh, so yeah, it, I wouldn't say it's like a, it's not going like full like tax or something like that. It's not doing a, you know, this massive you know, world-ending story and all that kind of thing. But for what it works, for what it does, it does great. Like I feel like if you, story-wise and uh, general length-wise, I would say this is kind of like a Night of Lotus here, uh, where you basically have a nice contained story for this area. Um, it has stakes. It has you know higher stakes going on as well. It does a pretty good job of explaining what's going on there. Um, there's actually a bit more background to a lot of the characters than I expected. Um, uh, I think uh, well, I'm not really going to go into any story spoilers there, but uh, but it had some really really great. Really cool gonna say is a, a beach town sort of town, I'm sure anyone that's, uh, that anyone that's played through this will know what I'm talking about, but that moment had me in a pretty tears. But, um, but yeah, what a beautiful introduction to a game of the game. Like, a lot of stories that just kind of low-key introduce you to an interesting game. Stuff. 